Thank you, Mikkel. Uh, I was about to actually beg for the applause myself, but, but, but you made it for me. Thank you. Uh, hello and good evening. My name is Andreas Sederström, and I'm a software developer working at uh, Factor 10. I work mostly with web-based applications. Uh, that's uh, pretty much what I've been doing since I started working in uh, 2010. So, uh, I would like to just raise of hands, how many of you work with development in some way? Whoa, is that everyone? Almost everyone, okay, so are you uh, programmers? Yeah, okay, programmers. Web-based applications? Cool. Do you write automated tests daily? Hands up, automated tests. Okay, so half of you. Okay, keep the hands up. Automated test using test-driven development. Oh, okay, cool. A couple of you. Uh, automated UI tests or end-to-end -end tests. UI tests, yeah, cool. End-to-end -end tests. Ah, well, 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 well. Um, just uh, trying to, to figure out uh, what type of crowd you guys are. Those of you who do not write automated tests or do not use test-driven de development, I'm just curious. What do you want to learn from me today? What do you want me to, to teach you or tell you or inspire you with? Shoot. Common pitfalls. Yep. Hopefully. Yeah. Anything else? How is it done? How is it done? How to test drive uh, development? Uh, excellent question. I will improvise a live coding session just for you and the rest of the guys. Uh, uh, it's not improvised. I prepared it. Uh, but there will be live coding, so I will actually actually show you how I'm working like this. Uh, cool. Uh, I want you guys to think about uh, a scenario. I want you guys to think about you are redecorating your bathroom at home. So you have like a, a bathroom with a toilet and you have a, a perhaps a, a tub, a shower, you have nice uh, uh, floor and walls, and you need to redecorate this. Uh, so you start building everything from scratch. Scratch. This is a software project, right? But it's your bathroom. So what you do? Uh, sorry, my clicker is not working. Let's do it like this. Oh, I can't change slides. Funny. There we go. Let's see if this works. Yes, and away with that. Think about the uh, the bathroom you're redecorating. So you have a faucet, you have a drain, you have a lot of piping, plumbing doing. Uh, you start programming all of this stuff, and you need to know that it's working. So you start writing a lot of unit tests. That's ha about half of you guys writing unit tests. And you can assert that every single piece of this bathroom is working. You can perhaps assert that the uh, water is coming out here a certain amount, uh, some water is passing through here at a certain amount. Everything is working bit by bit. And then you put it together, all the unit tests are green, and you let your users in, and this happens. Have you ever experienced something like this during your development? Hands up if you have ever experienced this. <laughs> I have as well. So you do a lot of manual testing, right, to avoid this. You wouldn't actually let your users in before testing this. Uh, but it's common because we just focus on these little tiny bits and we think we're done. Okay. When we do this big re-decorations at home or in our code bases, when we do breakthroughs, when we refactor a lot of our production code and we refactor a lot of our test code, what's there to protect us? Those of you who do not write automated UI or end-to-end -end tests, how do you verify that stuff is still working before going to production? Anyone give me a suggestion? How can you verify that? Manual testing, anything else? That's it, right? There's, there's no other way. No testing. So you let your users test, uh, right? It's kind of cool. It's kind of brave. I didn't say I do it, but it's, it's no. possible. Yeah, I, I imagine the, the meme with the guy. I don't know his name. When I do my testing, I do it in production. And he has a glass of wine. Um, but let, let's say that you do 
uh, a large breakthrough in your code base. So you do a lot of refactoring and you have a lot of unit tests, perhaps even integration tests, and they're all green. Can you trust that? Will that mean that your application is working? Yes or no? No, it, it won't, because you will have the, the faucet again with the water all over the floor. Um, so I was thinking, what are we testing when we do this kind of test? Because I have written a lot of unit tests, and I, and I, and I thought for a long time that unit tests will cover everything. Uh, maybe some integration tests for, for uh, the rest of it, but uh, that'll, that'll do for me. Uh, so I, I started thinking, because I had some issues in production, we had some incidents, of course, we had the water all over the floor. Uh, what am I testing with the unit tests? Am I testing features, actually? Am I testing the behavior, behavior which my users care about? And I was honest to myself, and I said, no, I'm not. I'm testing, perhaps, functions. Perhaps I'm testing algorithms. But I'm not testing user behavior. So then I ask myself, am I really testing my model? And the model here is like the solution to the business problem, OK? Am I really testing that solution? Or am I just testing like software components, which the users do not care about? <sighs> and I, I had to admit to myself that this is not enough. I'm not testing the model. I'm not testing what my users care about. Uh, my users care about the black box, not the inside of it. They care about the outside, the features, the things they can see and interact with. So this is not enough. So what do I do? Well, I go to the testing pyramid. You guys have seen this, right? Yes. And I was, I pretty much had all my tests down here. Some up here, most of them down here. So I started climbing writing uh, all my unit tests, TDD, of course, because that's awesome, uh, writing my integration tests afterwards, which is kind of tricky, uh, writing my end-to-end -end tests or UI tests, depending on how you run them, uh, which was super hard because I wrote them afterwards. And when I run them and they finally go green, and I'm, I'm super happy, I commit my code, push it, and then they run on the CI server, and Jenkins reports this. Though this is a protractor test case, I think. Uh, yes, it is protractor tests. Uh, and I have no idea what's going on here. So uh, at, le at least I know which test this is. But I can't for the love of me figure out what it is. Um, so I started thinking again. How do I design software? Uh, because I'm thinking that the problem is with me, not, not the software or the test. The problem is with me. So how do I design software? Do I go top-down, like from a user perspective, outside and in? Do I do bottom-up, writing my functions, TDD style, working my way up the stack? I don't know. You guys, any, anybody prefer top-down, bottom-down? Uh, sorry, bottom-up. Who, besides me, is a bottom-up person? So you like start with the nitty-gritty functions and you build your way up, okay? And the rest of you are top-down then, okay? You're both, depending on the use case and uh, the scenario. I prefer bottom-up. Uh, but of course, there's uh, drawbacks with this. Uh, the, the major drawback is that I can spend a lot of time doing stuff which never, ever reaches the user. So I can, I can be programming on a feature for days without even affecting the UI, the, the stuff that the users care about. And that's a bad thing. Perhaps I'm doing the wrong thing. I'm not sure yet, because I haven't reached the UI. I haven't reached the browser or whatever the UI runs in. Uh, so I started thinking, perhaps I'm spending too much time doing this. Perhaps I'm doing it the wrong way. Perhaps I'm attacking this from the wrong angle, bottom up. And I, again, started thinking, what do my users care about? And again, how do I design software? Uh, well, if, if I just leave the programming out of it, if I start thinking about how do I go about understanding how I build a new feature, well, I, I try to look at stuff from the user perspective, right? I write use cases. I write personas, which I can use to, to, uh, to reflect my features with. Uh, I write uh, stories for them, and I I go from the outside and in, take the user perspective, and I describe how the system is going to work. And then, 
once I'm done with that, I take the complete opposite route and I start building functions as my next step, which is... Is it logical? No. I should be carrying on with the same path, like from the user, do my stories, do my overhead design, start working my way down the stack instead, or continue working down the stack. So, when I do my programming, when I write the first line of code, when the first commit comes, I should probably start with what the users care about. And they do not care about the inside of the black box, right? They care about what they see, what they can interact with. And that's when it hit me, because I'm a TDD fan. I love writing my tests first. Uh, and, and you know the stack trace, which I showed you, the, the black screen with the, with the stack trace? The problem with that was it was test after. So I had written all my program code, ran it, and it worked once on my machine. I shipped it, and it didn't work on the CI server. That's because I wrote the test after. The beauty of TDD is like, TDD will drive your design, and if you start with the test, you will force the code to be testable which is kind of logical. So if I write the end-to-end -end test first, or the UI test first, maybe that will help me design a system which is testable at this level. Sounds wacko? Interesting? Have anybody tried this? You have? Sweet, we need to go for a beer later. Or, or a soda, if you're into soda. Uh, of course, I'm not first uh, in the world to think about this. Uh, this is uh, roughly called the London style TDD, where you work yourself from the top to the bottom or outside in, or a mockiest way of TDD. Call it whatever you like. Um, but I don't come across it very much. I come across the other path where you start building the functions and, and work your way up. So I started working from the outside in. Just give it a spin, try what, what happens. What will happen to my system? And I actually had a, a very thankful project to do this. I was, uh, I was a lone developer in the project. Uh, there was no other developer. There was no tester who could do my manual testing. Uh, so I was, I was alone. And how do I keep regressions from getting into the code base? Well, I need these kind of tests. I need the top level tests because they will replace manual testing to some degree. So I wrote my first end-to-end -end test case without having any production code. And of course, as in TDD, it was red, and it was awesome. And I started treating these tests like my specifications. You know, this is something we say as developers, uh, tests are not just tests, they're specifications, but they're after production, right? You write your code first, you write the test second, and if those tests are the specification, then they're not worth anything, right? Because you, have, you should have the specification first, and then you write whatever you want to write. So I forced myself to use these tests as specifications, which meant that I had a domain expert which could read these tests. So I, so I had to write these tests so the domain expert could understand them as well. And thus they just became specifications without any more work put into it. So these tests actually told the story of the application by reading these tests, and I just had like 15, 20 of these tests. By reading them, you could understand everything this application was capable of, which is kind of cool. And then you, sh you guys should say that these tests are fragile, right? They're bad. If you ever have written these kind of tests, they're fragile. Can you say it? They're fragile. They are, they are very fragile, right? Slow. And slow. Do you know why? Uh, that's why I'm okay. <laughs> they are fragile. Uh, they are so fragile that I, I heard about a company, a large company based in uh, uh, in Kolsikluna, where I'm from. Uh, and in the world, they make telecommunication parts. They had a large end-to-end uh, <laughs> uh, -end test uh, bed, you could call it which took uh, a little more than 24 hours to run. Uh, so they had large projects, like trying to trim it down to below 24 hours, so they can run it each night. Uh, but they were fragile. So they actually spawned three separate environments and ran the suite on three separate environments. And if one of those were green, they said that the suite is green. Uh, so that's how fragile they were. Um, and they're flaky. And actually, I, I found a simple answer to why. And it's again, it's because we write them afterwards. So if we write them first, 
it will mean I will run these tests a lot of times on my computer. And if they're flaky, I will find it on my computer. It will not be flaky in the CI environment later. It will be on my computer. And I will have to fix it before I even commit and push the code. So if I run them first, I will run them more, which make them more robust. Um, and the other things to make them flaky is like you have in infrastructure. You said they were slow. If you have network involved here, which you should have if they are real end-to-end -end tests, perhaps it's just a Docker network, but there should be something. This will make them slow. Uh, you will have animations if it's a uh, GUI. You'll have uh, timing issues, subsystems not responding in the correct order, which you expect. And that's due to high speed because we run these tests really fast. They're faster than a user, of course. And you could also have dependencies on external systems. So what I urge you guys to do in order to overcome this, you will face these things when, when writing these kind of tests and you have to handle them. And, and there's a lot of tools to help you out and you can be defensive in your program and just handle them. Make sure to overcome these on your local environment before pushing anywhere else or you will have them uh, later on. Uh, and the last one is probably the most tricky one because this is about state, like putting your system in a known state. And if you have an external system, just mock it. If it's not under your control, mock it, stub it, fake it, do whatever, just to make your test stable. If it's out of your control, you cannot affect it anyway, so just mock it. That's my biggest takeaway from this. As I said, TDD is your friend, so just start writing these tests first. It's not okay to say, I will develop this feature, uh, and once I'm done, I will be writing some tests. Uh, it'll take a day or two, and then I'm done. Start with the test, do it, because it will actually save you time doing the actual production code. Uh, and another thing for, um, for flakiness is actually that the tests we write like this is often too big. Oh, there it comes, stub or fake external calls, sorry, sorry. But the big thing, I want to talk about that uh, for a short peri period. We tend to make these tests like describing an entire feature or an entire user story, perhaps. We can do a lot of things. If it's a web shop, you could actually write a test which, <laughs> which searches for products, searches for the product coffee mug, and then you take the search result up here, and you assert that the length of it is one, uh, and the result should contain some awesome coffee mug. You click it, add it to your cart, then you start asserting stuff on the cart here. The length of the cart should now be one, and it should contain the awesome coffee mug. And to the total amount here of the cart should be uh, 79 kroners. Um, this is a too big test case for an end-to-end -end test. Do you agree? Yes, thank you. <laughs> It's too big because it's actually testing like four, three or four things. It's testing product search. It's testing adding to cart. Some of your users will enter the web shop, search for products, and then leave. So that's a use case. That should be one test. And when you have that test, so if you have a search for product test up here, that should be one test. And when you run the next test, which is Add it to cart, assert that the cart has one awesome coffee mug and the total amount is whatever. Then you do whatever hackish way you can to just force the item into the cart. Use a REST API, use whatever backdoor you know, because you guys have designed the system, so just put it in the cart. I don't care how you did it, just make it be there. Because if you start this test by, by searching for product and the search function goes bananas, it doesn't work, then the, I'll go back, sorry. Uh, 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 cannot flip again. If this goes red, you're not actually sure what type of functionality you have been uh, ruining. But if this goes red up here, and this still goes green, then you know exactly what's wrong. So try to keep these tests very small. And this, my friends, is when refactoring becomes very easy because now you have 
test driven your application from the outside and in. You have written your end-to-end -end tests or UI tests first. And you have run them a lot of times locally, and then you have run them a lot of times in your CI environment. And they're actually not flaky anymore. So now you can start doing refactoring, because these end-to-end -end tests, they don't care about if you're using Angular, React, or just vanilla JS, or if it's server-rendered. They don't care. Just rewrite that, and these tests will probably still work. You, you might have to change some details, but they will work. So my, my four biggest tips to give you guys to, to take away before we start live coding is write these tests from your user, user perspective. Use your domain experts and use a common language. And just write these tests before you do anything else. Just try it. Your, perhaps the domain expert is like your uh, system owner or something like that. If they can see the test, they will start trusting the test. They will start trusting you guys. They will start trusting that if these tests are green, the system is green, which is good for everyone. So write the UI tests first, do it from the users, do it together with people who understand the actual business case here. Okay, should we do some live coding or do you guys just wanna hang out? Live code, will you help me out then? Yes. Now, uh, the main reason for, for, for this specific system, which I'm, uh, which I'm talking about, is that I wrote those tests first. That is the main reason. Uh, and in doing that, uh, the tests were read, uh, perhaps for sometimes even days. I could have a, a red UI test or an end-to-end -end test, which was read. And I started working my way down the stack, doing like uh, UI components, we had an Angular application doing the UI components, just stubbing out the back end, then working down on the back end side, fixing stuff there, going all the down all the way the way down to the database. And then working my way up, all of a sudden the UI test started be going green instead. Uh, so I would say that it, it's because I, I ran this all the time locally. And if I had like timing issues anywhere during the, the way, I would sort them out straight away. So they don't come as a surprise later on when I'm finished with my feature. Uh, so I'm, I'm actually not finished until I have run this test like a thousand times and, and they work. That's the main reason. So basically you identified some issues. <coughs> yes, yes. Because they will be uh, slow. They will have time. Uh, they will have timing issues. Of course, you can't you can just magically throw that away. Uh, but in order to just uh, to deal with it, you have to to expose yourself for it uh, during a long time. So just just by turning the order of which I do things. Is that the fire alarm or is it uh, is it your phone, Stig? You have the magic uh, post-it. <laughs> So you just show the post it to the to the whatever the dial pad. Okay, thank you. Any other questions before we do yes? Yes I do. So still more unit tests than the uh Yes I do. Um these kind of tests do not substitute unit tests. They do not substitute integration tests. And they are few. Yes. So uh, for this application, this specific application, I think I had like 15 to 20 end-to-end -end tests, maybe 50 to 60 integration tests, and uh, put a zero on that, and you have the unit tests, perhaps more. Uh, I can't remember the sort of number of lines of code. Uh, but yes, it's a pyramid. I, I've read, uh, read a lot of blog posts saying that you could turn it upside down, uh, do whatever, but, but don't. It's too slow. The unit tests, will actually protect you on a, on, a, on a faster level, on a slower level, on a more robust level. Uh, and I have a, collo a colleague who said that uh, if I start verifying a, a, a feature with a UI test, and I find out that I can verify it with an integration test while working my way down, I will just throw the end-to-end -end test or the U UI test. I'll throw it away. 
if that has been tested in the UI before and I just need to test this new feature on an integration level, I'll do that. So I can just throw the UI test away because it's slower. And if I find out that I can actually verify it with just a unit test, I will throw the integration test as well, just to keep a high speed on my builds. Uh, and he said, how low can you go? And I think it's kind of, it's a great uh, uh, way of thinking about it because it's, if I can verify this on a lower level, if, if it has already been verified to some other extent in a UI test, do it as a unit test. Good question, very nice. Yes. I had two huge ones, which I hated, but, but I love them. Um, yes. And they actually verified, it, it was kind of like this, uh, this test over here, uh, but it, it was like uh, perhaps 20 rows more. But they verified from uh, arriving at the landing page, searching products, adding them, filling in forms, buying them, going all all the way through as a happy path user would do. And I call those regression tests. And if everything else was uh, green and those were red, that never happened actually. But if, if that would have happened, I would have been afraid, very afraid. Um, because I need something to, to just cover my back uh, for the seams, as you say. But I had two of those. Yes, shoot. Sorry. Uh, yeah. If I went from top to bottom and then up again in the testing pyramid or in the call stack, both. Good. Um, yes. I, I I go first uh, top down writing the tests. Uh, so I I actually start with the UI test, uh, and that will be red. And then I start writing UI production code, sorry, UI production tests, perhaps unit tests for the UI component. And then I work my way down from that. And when I'm done with the, like the database integration, if I have to do stuff all the way down, then I just go upwards and hopefully all the tests I'm touching will just be green without me affecting any code. So it'll just be green on the way up. And once I know that the end-to-end -end test is green, I'm done. But if the end to end test would be green and the UI, uh, the unit test would be uh, red, that'd be kind of weird. Uh, then I probably designed my test wrong. Does that answer your question? Yes. Any other questions? You guys want to code, right? Yes, you do. Cool. Uh, I was thinking that maybe I should sit down by you guys, but uh, then again, I don't think so. Let's see. So if you guys want to grab any like refreshments, like beers or something, you should do that now. Nobody. Thank you. I am more important than beer to you guys. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I think I'll, I'll stand here if that's OK with you. So I just mirrored my display now, which is too hard on a Mac. Can you read this, or should we like dim the lights? Or, sorry, I can just increase the font size maybe. Can you read this code? Mm -hmm. So what we have here, we got something running on localhost 8080. So let's take a look at it. Uh, it's a demo application, and it welcomes us with a cute kitten. Uh, we have a home, uh, like a landing page, and we have members page. Uh, this line here is not there. <laughs> Ignore it. OK, so these are our, all our members. We have Kevin and Cortez. We have their age, and we can add new members. Let's try it. Uh, Andreas, age 33. Uh, nothing happens, OK. So this is where we're at. We're going to make this happen. And I have written some UI code here before 
Yeah, I know I cheated. That's just because you guys don't want to see me write a lot of code. You just guys want to see me write the test, right? So imagine it wasn't there. Um, but the things we're going to test here tonight is we're going to test this feature. We're going to add new members. So what's going to happen is we have a backend service, a REST API. Uh, I want to input data here. And when I submit that, it should be sent to the backend service. And I want this list here to, to reflect the new member as well. So the new member should be listed here as well. OK. Sounds good. How many of you guys have tried Cypress for testing? Couple. I'll be using Cypress now. Uh, so I installed Cypress earlier today, and I will just open it like this. So Cypress has like two ways of running. You can you can do Cypress open, or you can do Cypress run. Cypress run is is headless, and you can use it on your CI uh, servers. And open is for development. So we'll just start that and we will have some kind of window here telling us these are all the tests you have Andreas. Thank you. We have a members.js and a start page.js. Let's run them. And they're green. Yay, they're green. <laughs> no applause. Thank you. Uh, the first thing you guys I uh, should notice this. No, no, just let's take a look at the member page. We have a test here. It says contain some initial data. And when I'm clicking that, I can actually see all the steps my uh, tests have been uh, taking. So we have like visit the slash. Whatever happens, we can go through it. So here we visit submit. Sorry, we find a members button. We click it. The new URL. URL is submit. Uh, there's an HTTP get here for slash members to the uh, server side. And then we assert that we have a, a header. We should have Kevin, which is 12. We should have Cortez, which is 56 years old. So this is the test we have. Let's do something else. Let's do a new test. Okay, so this is the test we actually just saw in the, in the Cypress uh, dev tools contain some initial data. We want to do something else. What should we test? Come again. Add new member. Like that. OK. This is relevant, right? Um, so the first step would be what? Input. Thank you. Who said that? Brilliant. OK, uh, input. Let's go here. Sorry. The member page contains six. OK, so Cypress has some tools here for just helping us find the, the correct input. So we get the suggestion here, find input 16, which is kind of cryptic. Let's copy it and, and, and use. No, let's not use it. It's not readable at all. So let's just bring up dev tools. Oh, sorry. Dev tools and inspect this element. I think we have some better name for it. Close that. Ah, oh, here's my no. There's my input, right? Oh, we can't read that. Ah, it has a test ID, which is input name. I will use that. Kind of like this one. Huh. Thank you. So get the test ID, which was input name, right? And let's type in it, input. Give me a name, anything. Give me, a f we had Kevin Cortez, give me a female name. <laughs> Alice. Alice and Bob, nice. Did we have some security experts in here? Yes, Alice and Bob. <laughs> Type Alice, then what? Type the age, okay? Yes. <laughs> so let's do the same thing. Let's take a look at the age field. There we go. Input dash age. Age. 
I'm old. Can I sit with you? Thank you. <sighs> Better. Have you guys ever tried mob programming? Yeah, it's kind of like that. <laughs> so, uh, with type... An age. That's not an age. That's not a moon. Give me an age. 16? 16. <laughs> Sir? <laughs> Sir? <laughs> Uh, okay, let's save it and uh, let's see what happens uh, with the tests. Yeah. So my new test actually just showed up here and we can see what happens when Cypress finds the name, field, type it. Okay, so we can actually see what the DOM looked like when Cypress, Cypress was done. So uh, it seems kind of nice. We typed Alice and uh, there should be some typing of age here, but we don't assert anything so we don't get to see that. Okay, let's uh, submit, right? Uh, okay, let's inspect the submit button. I hope we have some kind of name for that as well. Uh, test ID button submit. Okay. There we go, button, submit. We shouldn't type on that one, we should click it. Okay, and I want some assertions. I, I, I want to make sure that something happened, okay? So, what should we assert? The list has three elements. The list has three elements, okay? So we had something up here uh, where we operate on something called members and it's a table, right? Because here we're using the first row and the second row. Yes. So let's assert that the table has three rows. Is that okay with you? Thank you. And we'll find it the rows there should have length. What? Wrong. Give me something else. Because if this works, then we'll be screwed, right? Four. 42, yeah. Run the test, Cypress. Come on. Let's close this. So, okay, what happened? Uh, Cypress is expected to have uh, a length of 42, but got two elements. That's great. So we can actually show change the value here. So what I did now was I forced the test to become red. If, if I had a written three here and that would have been green, the tests would lie to me, right? Because we haven't done any production code. So now I say three and Cypress will run the test and it will be red, which is good. And once this test is green, it means I'm done, right? It means I'm done. So, I have a component for this, where we, sorry? It's view component. Uh, and let's see here, you guys will, recognize some of the fields. We have the header, add new member, we have the fields, the test ID, input name, input age, we have the button which we're clicking, we have a method, add click, <coughs> sorry. What happens at click? Submit will happen, which is nothing. Okay. So I'm running out of time. I'm going to skip doing the post request and I'm just going to assert that the table has three elements. L just let's put it in the table, right? Is that okay with you guys? You guys? What, should <coughs> what should I do? Sorry? Edit the data. Uh, we actually had some uh, mounted stuff going on here. Mounted, fetch members, go to the REST API and get members. And then we populate uh, populate a list with members. 
So let's just push it to the members list. Yeah, this dot members. You said push, which is nice. Should we have? I heard Bob before. Name. I think it's name. Let's go up. We iterate all the members with name and age. So just let's just add Bob. He has an age as well. How old is Bob? 78. Okay. Uh, stuff is rebuilding. Let's run the test. That's bad. Or is it good? That's bad. So let's revisit the test. We typed Alice. We typed 16. So let's do something like this. We take Cortez and he's 56 years old. We'll just move him down here. We say that the third child in this table should be Alice, right? And it should contain 16, which is her age. I can't stand that. Cypress is running. Okay, so the first assertion up here is correct. We have three, but it's wrong. It's Bob. So let's go back to the component. Uh, we pushed Bob here, which is wrong. So I think we should actually use we have name here, which is a field on the component. So let's just use this, the component dot name and this dot age. What do you guys think? Will the Cypress test be red or green? Ho hopefully, come on. Is it red or green? Okay, green? Yeah, red? Oh. Let's save it. And rerun it. And it's green, yeah. So, okay. The tests have now asserted that we have three elements. It has tested that it contains Alice and it has tested that it contains 16, which is her age. So if we were to change anything of this, the test would become red as well. Uh, and this is how I actually do my programming. Every feature which I'm building, I do it like this. I start with the end-to-end -end test. I run it all the time on my development machine. And I work my way down. I write unit tests as I go. I write integration tests as I go. And it's not harder than doing it the other way, which I used to do before. But the benefit is that I have a test suite which is robust, reliable, and, and it actually tests features which my users care about. Negative cases. So like if you were to put in age minus, yes, age zero, that's a... Yes, since this is a cooking show I have prepared. <laughs> um, I would check that in a unit test. Because what I'm testing here is just the, the happy path, what my uh, regular user would do. And then I will have a unit test which uh, tests whatever happens like this. Shall not allow empty age, shall not allow negative age. So I'll have tests asserting validation on the, on the component. So how low can you go? Can you do this in a, in a unit test? Yes, I can. And I can actually... on an end-to-end uh, -end level. Best question today. Uh, I think perhaps if I if I were to progress the development here, uh, I would have like some error lists, validation errors. Perhaps I'm programming for what happens when the server does not respond when I'm uh, when I'm out of uh, when I'm offline. I would write tests for that. Uh, so I, I, w I probably have one test asserting that I can show validation errors. I can give the user proper feedback if shit hits the fan. That would be a negative test. 
Does that answer your question? <laughs> ah, okay. Cool. Any other questions? What do you test and what don't you test? Because I saw that you had like you you display the members mm -hmm. header. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a real test or just something you show, but would you actually test that in a? Uh I would perhaps if it were uh, if it was localized in some way. I would test it. Uh, if it's not localized, if it's hard coded, I would probably not test it. Um, but it's a so maybe I actually. Just, just to have something which goes green. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, I always have to think about, uh, is this test valuable? Because it will take time and I don't want to be like the company which I describe, which like have a suite which runs on a little more than 24 hours. I don't want that test. And asserting just that a header is there, I can do that in a unit test. I can do that with a mocked browser or anything. I don't have to do that in an end-to-end -end test. Uh, so I, I'm actually more concerned about testing the seams, as you said, the man in the in the chair. I want to know how all my components work together, uh, not just two of them, just many of them together. That's what I'm curious about. So probably that's where I draw the line. Cool. So how long does it take to complete this? Uh, this test? Well, not your, an, an actual pr uh, project that you're working on. Yeah, this test took, all these tests took tr three seconds. Uh, the application which I talked about uh, earlier, they ran, on my computer, they ran for two and a half minutes. And I think there was like, I'm not sure, say there were 15, 15 tests. And two of those were the large regression tests. Uh, yeah, so it's not super fast, but it's faster than me clicking through the UI. It's faster than somebody else clicking through the UI. I'm not fast with the mouse at all, but but I assure you it's faster. Okay. Anything else? The pizzas has not arrived yet, so just keep throwing questions at me until the pizzas come. Anything? Do you guys... Uh, is this something you're willing to try out? Would you like go to your jobs tomorrow and say, hey, let's just try writing the end-to-end -end test first? Would you do that? Why not? Um, well, I mean, we could, I could, I could try, I, I could try it, but um, would you, do you change the entire team to work that way? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I'm. Um, I'm working on uh, on uh, another project which does not, uh, where we do not have this kind of test written uh, uh, from from start, which means that the the first test will be super expensive to write, because the test is, the system is not testable. Uh, and I actually wrote a couple of those tests, but I can't run them in a CI environment. I can just run them locally because it depends on me setting up all the external systems, setting up all the all the Docker images just the way they should be for this test to run. Um, so you could always start, if you are going to develop a new feature tomorrow, you will probably start clicking around in the browser, finding where should I start. And then you go browsing code, maybe you browse some uh, UI components and you start hacking and then you kind of like build that and start clicking in the UI again to see, did I break it or does it work? Does anything show up? It'll probably say hello world or lorem ipsum. So just test that, just write the test. Because as you see, uh, Cypress started a browser for me. This is a actual Chrome browser. I have, I have the dev tools here, so I can actually interact with the application afterwards. So why not just use this as your browser so you can click around and if and you find that I'm doing this kind of clicking all the time, just automate it. Why should you be doing that? It's, it's your time is worth money. Yeah. Did I talk you into it? Do you want to try it now?
that came out wrong. Sorry. <laughs> hmm? I'm working more as a test automation. Yeah. One of the worst, no, sorry. Yeah. Uh, one of the worst things in my world is uh, I'm writing, uh, building a new feature, and I'm uh, writing all my tests for it. Everything is happy, and I'm happy, and I, I uh, commit and I push it, and it's working. And then uh, some manual testing goes along, or perhaps some other person writes an automated test, and then they come back to me two days later saying that, uh, "Hey, Andreas, the stuff you wrote does not work." during these conditions, dur during these special cases of the negative. That's the worst thing, because I have my mind somewhere else. So yeah, you should write these first. You, sh you could actually write the test first, and it could, be, it could be dumb. It could be actually just empty methods, saying like, like add to cart. Cart should contain this and that. And it, maybe it's not even compiling. But give that to the developers and say, when this is green, come see me. Then, then it's working. So why not? Or, even better, just sit with the de developers and do it together. Because I think you know a lot about the domain, which the developers don't know. Developers know a lot about code and frameworks and not so much about the domains all the time. So sit with them and you might uh, learn, both of you. Do some pair programming or mob programming. Because this is fun, programming together. Just do that. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, that is kind of like uh, stretching it, I think, saying that the test is the spec. But in, m in my world, this is a specification. This actually describes how this application works. So if you can't read this, then you probably don't understand English. But you don't have to be a programmer to read this. Do you agree? Kind of. It will take some getting used to, yeah, it, it will. But once you go over that bump, it will take a, a coffee break and uh, an hour. Then probably anybody can, can, uh, can read this. And if this is not readable, to, uh, to like domain experts or, or testers, find a way to make it readable and also executable, and they will become specifications. Does that answer the question? Yeah, cool. Mm -hmm. Ah, uh, good question. <laughs> I, I, I like Cypress because the, the developer experience is uh, it's, it's awesome. Uh, and as you can see, I had the browser, I have all the, the help. They like take screenshots and, and uh, capture videos for me on the CI server. Uh, but I've written a lot of tests in, in uh, Protractor and with Selenium and Selenoid, stuff like that. Uh, if you were to start from scratch, I would say go with Cypress today. The, the drawback is they don't have like multi-browser support yet. So they only have Chromium. Uh, but if you guys have like a couple of protractor tests already or Selenium tests or whatever, test cafe, go with that. If the threshold is lower, go with that. Just as low, long as it doesn't slow you down because it's, it's not the tool who will actually save the day. It's how you use it. It's, it's using it before writing the production code to make the test robust by running it over and over and over again during your development. That's, that's where the magic happens. Cool. Uh, yes. Actually, during this project, which, which I'm talking about, I try, uh, so the question was, uh, have you tried Puppeteer? Yes, I tried Puppeteer and yes. So Puppeteer for interacting with the browser and just for like, like a test runner. Uh, and it was uh, very nice. I liked it a lot. And uh, I, I ran into some issues, 
stubbing out network calls. I ran into some uh, troubles debugging my tests when they uh, when they uh, ran red. So I just looked around for another tool and I found Cypress and I tested that and I fell in love. So <laughs> so I, I haven't left it since. Uh, I tested uh, Test Cafe, but uh, I liked Cypress more. But you, of course, run with the uh, Puppeteer. Puppeteer is, is kind of like more uh, raw than Cypress is. You, you have more access to the browser with Puppeteer. Um, Cypress has like nifty features for that, but uh, Puppeteer will probably grant you more permissions than Cypress will. Uh, Cypress is kind of opinionated as well, so it's they have a way to go. This is how you should write the tests, and this is wrong, this is right. Uh, you don't, I, I don't think you get that with Puppeteer. Uh, so it's basically depends on your use case. Um, it, it wasn't bad, it was just a little more, a little better developer experience here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, should we, should we try it? Let's see, I haven't done it in a while. Um, Mostly I just click around in the in the dev tool, but let's see. I think you actually can, so like here, we could add the bug, I think it's just like that. And the, the test runner will stop there. Sorry, here it is. No, they, uh, sorry, I, hmm, add you member debug. Is it just side debug, maybe? It would be awesome if anybody has tried this and could just come to my rescue now. But yeah, uh, <laughs> they have the debug function which, which actually stops ex execution right there. Ah! Now I remember, sorry. This is a prerequisite. You have to have the developer tools up for the debug to work. So this will actually not stop tests in your CI environment, which is good. So they will just work locally. Yeah. Holy cow, what happened? We stopped at the breakpoint and <laughs> this is what I'm talking about when I say that developer experience is kind of nice because they actually put this major inspect over here to inspect the current subject. <laughs> Okay, please make it more obvious. So uh, what happened is um, I said, uh, Cypress, go get uh, the test ID input age, the, that field, and type 16 into it. And then I want to debug. So that's when Cypress breaks. Uh, so what I'm looking at here is the output of the type command. So I Thing. Uh, is that the subject? Did I... what happened? I will have like... basically access to the entire window in the document, uh, the entire scope. I can see which event was fired. Um, I think if you go to the console you will see exactly what has happened here, uh, which uh, commands were fired. Yeah, it lets you debug. Um, okay. Can I see the, um, is it the new file which contains the markup? Yes. So do you have this um, test ID everywhere? Mm -hmm. So this is, so in order to uh, um, find things easily, Yeah, uh, absolutely. If we we could just uh, like say that we have a class on this one uh, called Kevin. Uh, test will be green, right? Because carry on. So the tests are. Let's run them again. Tests are green, and then we can instead of which one did I change? The input name. So I could say get and use the CSS selector Kevin like that, and the test should still be green. I 
It was not. Time. Didn't I use a... Hmm. Maybe I just... Hmm. Not sure if the... Can you do this in view? Like add a proper, proper class here. Uh, it should should get the first one. Let's uh, let's see. I'm on thin ice right now, so let's. Uh, but yeah, basically, th this is just as you can see. It's just a CSS selector, so you can use the ID or you can use the class. And and to answer your question, I I tend to use specific attributes for my tests. Uh, I, I I don't want to use IDs if they are for something else, because if I change that, I don't have to update the tests, and so it's. And Cypress recommend that you use, instead of test ID, they say use Psi or data Psi. Uh, but use Psi, but then it feels awkward to use this in like unit tests for my uh, my unit, my components. So test ID it is, but I'm curious to why this is not f working. We could see. So run the test. Subject, it's a div. Kind of strange, right? It's a male small container. Yeah, so view is probably converting, adding the class to the div, right? Instead of the input field. I think so. Let's have a look. This is a browser, so we can just have a look. Let's see here. The, the name. Okay, sorry about all the flickering. Uh, so there's the div, there's the label. Where's my Kevin? Sleep. Kevin is up here. So you can't type in a div, that's just, <laughs> that's just silly. So just to make this work and to rectify myself. Uh, let's find an input underneath Kevin. And that test should hopefully be green. Uh, let's run it again. Yeah, so that works. Thank you. Thank you, View, for messing up my presentation. Um, yeah, long answer to your question. Okay. Any final questions or else I'm gonna stop here and we can uh, just hang around, grab a couple of beers, have some crisps or whatever. Um, fun fact is uh, Cypress actually picked up that I'm gonna do uh, a meetup talk. So they sent me a couple of t-shirts. It's the black ones up there and there's also stickers. So if you want them, grab them. They're not sponsoring me in any other way. So it's th they're from you, uh, they're for you. Uh, Take them if you want to, uh, but uh, otherwise, thank you very much for listening. Don't hesitate to uh, ask any more questions tonight or just contact me. I should probably show the last slide where you can find me. <laughs> so just contact me on, on Twitter, send me an email, anything. If you think that this is probably something that you guys would like to try, but maybe it's too hard, maybe it's too tough, maybe it's Maybe I can't convince my developer team. So just just give me a nudge and I'll come help you guys. So thank you very much. <laughs>